We have Ronco Ferreira, who's actually a Dutchie, but he lives in Barcelona now. Um, so please welcome Ronco to the stage. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. Uh, as mentioned, I'm Dutch, but I live in Spain. That's my office. It's got a palm tree. Dutch people love palm trees. They make pictures of palm trees. But I'm not sure if Dutch people will make pictures of an oak. Anyway, so um, I'm heading a product team in Telefonica Alpha. And just a bit of background, uh, I started here in Holland uh, Innovation Management and Industrial Product Design in Delft. And then it's psychology as well in Leiden, and then so it's interior and exhibition design in Australia. Why interior and exhibition design? Good fun. And I've been working at agencies in London, then worked at Electrolux connecting a washing machine to the internet in '99 because you could do it, and then the question was, should you do it? And then I started working in health uh, around eight years ago, and I found out that. Um, there's a lot of innovation happening in, in, in health, and it's really, it's really good. So the technology, what you can do to bring better health to, in this case, elderly people was really good. But then, at one moment, I had a, we had a product, and it worked in the south of Spain, it worked so so. But in Barcelona, it worked marvelously. And this was a product for people with a heart condition. So, elderly people with a heart condition, what it means is that they start retaining a lot of liquid, so they get heavier. And what this product did was that it brought together the weighing skill and communicated that with a nurse, a nurse in the hospital. And if people start to gain a lot of weight in like two days, that's an alert that something needs to change. Well, in the South of Spain, it didn't work, but in Barcelona, we had a drop of 48% in mortality. That means that half less people died, kind of nice metric. Um, and the difference there was Nurse Anna. And Nurse Anna was the one that would call the patient, be there with that person, install it in their home, and simplify the whole service. So, coming from design, coming from engineering, uh, working on having a UX team in health, I find that, well, there's a huge opportunity to help in, in health. So that's a bit of background for me. So a while ago, we set up in Telefonica, set a company called Telefonica Alpha. And what we're focusing on is on long-term innovation. So some people call it a kind of moonshot, which is a bit of a lame term, but it works. Uh, and we're looking at how we can innovate for like in, in, in 10 years. Like how can we work on something that has, is a big issue, in this case, health. It has a big social impact, so not just revenue. And it must be combined with a big tech breakthrough. And in this case, we use a lot of data analysis, AI, as you might call it, machine learning to bring it all together. Well, just explain a bit like why this is such a big issue. At the moment, there's a big epidemic of, of chronic diseases. And it creates a huge burden on society itself. And if you look at this, the cost of health is rising every year. So you only have to look at the US, and I don't know if anyone has been and by accident stepped into a US hospital from Europe. Anyone ever did it? Okay. Costly, pricey? Yeah, very expensive. Okay. So if in Europe you go into a hospital, and normally people don't even uh, think of how much that will cost. Um, for example, in Spain, there were big demonstrations because elderly people had to pay 90 cents for a drug that, by the way, cost 80 euros. But if you go to a US hospital, you notice that the costs are massive. So this cost will go up and up and up, and people will get older, older, and older. So it's going to be unsustainable. You might think, like, in when we get older, that most probably, I'm not sure if the government can still pay for your healthcare costs. Um, but then if you start looking at how combat that people actually die, just light-hearted items and subjects on this early morning, uh, it turns out that uh, we're not dying of uh, massive outbreaks of Ebola anymore. The Spanish flu is gone. Um, uh, HIV is still a terrible disease, but it's manageable and you don't have to die of it. So it starts to become that we're not dying of, of, of epidemics anymore. But what we do die of 
is chronic diseases that are caused by behavior. Because actually, 80% of the chronic diseases are caused by, by, by how you behave in your day to day. Just to spit that out a little bit, these are the top five behaviors. So, sleeping well is extremely important. If you start to sleep very little, uh, you might get a lot of conditions. Um, if you're not drinking too much alcohol from time to time, it's fine, guys. Tonight is okay, but don't go overboard. That you stay active, you don't, don't just watch TV and, and don't move the house. That you're eating healthy and that you don't smoke. So in the past, we worked with uh, the London School of Economics with a professor called Paul Dolan on a program where we looked at how we could bring down uh, people's alcohol consumption. What we found out when you ask about why people drink a lot, um, you drink because you know, you're in a bar and everyone does it. But a lot of people drink as well to forget, to, you know, at the end of the day, you're really freaked out, you're stressed out, and it calms your brain a bit. And a lot of people drink just to calm your head down. So, it's about the behavior and how you really feel. The other day, to me, there was a program of, uh, really tough program, actually, but I will admit that I watched it anyway, uh, about people that are 300 kilos. I mean, and then they go to the doctor, and then, uh, so this was in uh, Houston, and that was 300 kilo first, and they have to get in the car, and uh, then have to get to the doctor, and uh, they get to the doctor, and it takes them like two days to get to Houston, and uh, then when they get there, they get out of the car, they talk to the doctor, and the doctor says, okay, yeah, um, yeah, you have to eat healthier. Uh, so uh, come back in two months if you lose uh, 40 kilos. And he sends them off. All right. Nice. That's not really going to solve the problem. Because when you start looking at what these people ate 300 kilos, I mean, sitting on the couch and eating hamburgers the whole day, I don't know how many hamburgers you can eat in a day, but there's something more than just, I'm hungry. In this case, it's those people that stuff their faces, really, because they're filling a gap. They're filling a gap of that they don't feel really good about themselves. And the same about sleeping well. Uh, at the moment, we work on a, on a, on a product that to help people sleep better. And what we found out, a lot of people sleep not really great because, you know, you go to bed, you're worried about something, you might be ruminating, thinking about something the whole time. So when we look at all of this, why these five behaviors are there, we see like one underlying behavior there and one underlying cause. And that actually is mental well-being. Like how you feel about yourself, if you're really stressed, are you anxious, do you feel good, do you feel really bad? And that causes a lot of these behaviors. So at Alpha, we're focusing on mental well-being. And just to give you an idea like what a massive issue that is, it's 25% of people, like us, will experience a mental health issue during your life. You might have anxiety, you might have depression, you might have body image concerns, you might have obsessive compulsive disorder. There's a whole range of conditions with really nasty names uh, that describe us, like how we are in a day to day. But then if you start to look at what help is there out there, it's very little, and especially in low and middle income countries. It turns out that this whole problem of 25% of, of, of us having a mental health condition during our life might be way bigger because people go undiagnosed. Um, the other day I was in a taxi with a, with a gentleman and uh, going to the airport and he mentioned, yeah, my, my son, and he's really feeling really bad and uh, he has voices and uh, yeah, he's now living on the street, and uh, my wife is now alcoholic because she can't handle the situation of her son. And uh, he found, um, I think, a girl that he can talk to. So I tried to convince him, well, sir, maybe he has to see a psychiatrist because it looks like the guy is schizophrenic. And the guy lives next to the hospital. Next to the hospital with the best psychiatrist, he specializes in the condition, and he doesn't know it. So, low middle income countries, there's no psychiatrist out there. But even the, just the stigma and not knowing it is already a massive issue. So there you go. 25% of people have mental health conditions over their lifetime. And in 50% of the countries, there's one psychiatrist per 200,000 people. 
So that's one psychiatrist for 50,000 people. And we complain about having sinky customers or having frightened patients. This is what we're talking about. These people are normally hidden. Okay, and now we're really going to get uh, to the bottom of this. Uh, on the worst case, that means that in Europe, every year, uh, 58,000 people take their lives. That's every three days, people that sit in the Boeing 747. Okay, life had a success, no? Well, looking at that, um, it turns out not everything is bad. So, if you go to the hospital, you can have a rash and it kind of annoys you a little bit. And, uh, but you can as well have like a terminal, like brain tumor. Well, with mental health, it's the same thing. I can have like a bad day, but I can have well, like a whole bad life. So, it goes all the way from being terribly unhappy to actually feeling really happy. So, let's take one step back. This talk was not about mental health, it was actually about uh, UX strategy for innovation. So, also, we're set up to work on this big issue. So, this is our issue. This is what makes me get out of bed. Uh, this makes me drive to actually use innovation for, for something to make a big, big change there. So, in also, we look at long term innovation. So, I don't know if people know this. So in innovation, there's a lot of differences. I can innovate, as Zach already mentioned, I can innovate to improve our own business. But you can innovate as well to set up completely new businesses. So McKinsey calls this the Horizon model. So you have innovation for Horizon 1, you have innovation for Horizon 2, and you have innovation for Horizon 3. And we're going to focus now on Horizon 3, and I put beyond on it because it says like you create a new business, but actually we're trying to create a completely new market or completely change how that actually and currently works. So, Horizon 3 and beyond. So we're not looking at now, we're not looking at a new new company, we're actually looking at like, okay, what will work in, in several years. And if you start looking, and in my past I found out like, how come that um, the user experience doesn't really work if you don't get the user experience that you, that you really want. And what I find out working in the past is it's not about the user experience on itself. It's actually the user experience, as we're talking about behavior, designing for behavior change, it is actually user experience is the product. And I come from a background from user experience design and I moved into product management. And uh, the reason was um, I can create a great user experience that no one cares about the problem we're solving. Or the user experience we create is a local optimum, as Zach mentioned. Like we're optimizing for this little mountain. But if we take one step back, we could actually optimize the whole process. And just to go back to what I explained before on the product we did for people with uh, heart problems, I found that we had a tablet. And then there was a really great tablet. It was a Windows tablet from a long time ago, from five years ago now. And then I had a weighing scale. So this elderly gentleman had to step on the weighing scale every morning. And he described it um, every morning before, uh, uh, in Spanish, we call it antes de hacer pis. It's before going to the toilet. Um, I have to step on the scale and uh, take my weight. And I have to press the button. Okay, yeah, that was it. But what he did then is he pressed the on-off button. And I don't know if five years ago you switched on and off a Windows computer with the on-off button, which makes sense. But then you get the black screen of death or the blue screen of death. I mean, you have an elderly person, 80 years old, he's already scared to touch the computer because he's afraid to break it. So broke. So the question there was that, well, we can optimize the user experience of that and we can just get rid of the whole tablet itself. And we just have this gen they're all connected to the nerve and it's just a call. There's no technology there. So what I find out like, okay, sometimes you need to do a step back to actually see the bigger picture so that you can improve and create better products and better services after that. So what I find out like for Horizon 1 and 2, the big barriers for creating a good product and a good user experience is quite often that there's no clear objective. There's no early prototyping and there's no testing. So, 
we work in innovation, and uh, everyone loves innovation because not saying that you innovate is kind of saying that you are like kind of staying behind. But then when you get to it, normally we talk about innovation, and um, and then all the buzzword starts coming in. So um, why don't we use blockchain? Why? And uh, yeah, we need to use the AI because AI is extremely important. Uh, so why don't we do like a blockchain-based AI predictive algorithm to define the size of balloons? Good, nice. So there's a lot of, of as Steve Blen calls it, innovation theater. And in my company, you have it as well. So uh, we have a drone, and then we have something with blockchain. And then we have uh, some kind of model and algorithm that predicts uh, whatever it might be. And then uh, the, the president of the country comes in and they're going, oh, this is interesting, that's really beautiful. And, uh, and uh, oh, great thing you have, by the way. Okay, so we'll go for lunch now. So the innovation theater is where you do the innovation just to do good to other people. Uh, uh, like in I mean, what do you think about that? We all have a little bit of ego, but um, let's. Uh, keep that at the door and really make a difference. So, if you don't have a clear objective, you never know if you get there, you never know if the product is good, you never know if you're just being in a very theater or you're actually really making a difference. The second one, the second issue we find a lot, there's no lean, there's no agile, and uh, we define an absolutely great brief for a product that we don't know how it will be, we do a request for a proposal, and um, yeah, the company comes in and they say we can definitely do that. And then a year later, we found out they can't. Nice, because you can't predict the future, guys. It's impossible. So you can't predict the future. You don't know what will come. There's no chance that I can tell you in one year. I'm going to have this blockchain-based AI-powered prediction of balloon size. What we can do is use Lean and Agile, and as Seth mentioned, using design, design thinking, Lean startup, however you want to call it, but work in small iterations. And then the last one that I come across a lot is related that you have the silos. So, um, for this product that I just mentioned to you about people that have a heart condition, we had a new CTO. And we just did user research and we found out that, yes, elderly people get really nervous when they have to use a computer. And uh, we started and we called it the tablet, but people thought that it was a cheese tablet, like a cheese board. And uh, that didn't work. And that using the word tablet or computer that really freaked them out because they thought I'm going to break it and I don't know about it. So the nurse called it la pantallita, the screen, because the screen is like a TV, you know, and we know how a how TV works. We did the user research and uh, we found out that uh, people had issues with the tablet, the switching on and off, we need to upgrade to like a more user friendly tablet because people just didn't take their weight. Therefore, we couldn't detect if they were getting worse. Therefore, the nurse couldn't call them, and therefore, we couldn't lower mortality and improve the health. So the CTO said, yeah, but <laughs> we need to have at least a little bit, like a minimum level of technology, use, technology knowledge of our customers, isn't it? I mean, seriously, they don't even know how to switch on the tablet. Okay, I mentioned that kind of uh, market uh, possibilities by 90%, so that's not really going to work. And that was just pure of, of, of having different silos and not working in the same direction. In the end, we're there to improve health. So then when we start looking at Horizon 3 and 4, that's where if we start looking at innovation, everything is beautiful and it's full of shiny objects. But when you get there, it turns out to be slightly more difficult. Because I come out to you as a designer and I tell you, well, we're going to work on this product that there's nothing comparable to it yet, and I don't know if it's going to be possible. And there's a huge uncertainty. I don't know if it's possible. I can't tell you what we're going to do. I can't tell you if it's going to be successful. Actually, I can tell you with 75% chance it will be unsuccessful. 
And then it turns out, hmm, that's actually not that interesting. And uh, if I start looking at the reactions that I got from, for example, development team, they said, yeah, well, that's, um, that's too unstable for me. And uh, what's the roadmap? Well, I don't have a roadmap yet because I don't know if it will work. I can give you a, a, a bullshit roadmap for the next two years. And if that makes you feel calm, I'm okay to do it. But just be sure that I'm completely sucking it out of my thumb. And some people are really comfortable with it until you change it and then they're not comfortable anymore. And then the other part is like it's high uncertainty. And over the past months, I find out that uh, there are people that love it. They go on like, wow, that's the coolest thing ever. We're going to create new products. And there's a lot of people that say they like it, but when they get to it, anxiety booms up like this. Because what am I going to do in a month? I don't know. Define, depends on yourself. Like, uh, if it works, you continue with it. If it doesn't work, we might have to change team or we might have to uh, swap things around. So people really hate it. And it turns out that high uncertainty is really good, but it's one of the main drivers of anxiety in people's workplace. Knowing that you do something good, if you don't really know yet if it's good or not. And if you don't have a roadmap, you don't have a plan what you're going to be in several months, it turns out that people really don't like it. Some people do, some people don't. So we're going to focus on, and I'm going to show you some examples of how we handle this and how we go about working with high uncertainty, not having any comparison products, and that, uh, you know, things still all the time. So what we're looking at is designing for in 10 years. So we have a team of AI specialists, like 10 of those, and a team working on behavioral analysis for mental well-being. So they're looking at behaviors you have every day. So what you have in your pocket. Before you go to bed, what do you do with your phone? Put it next to it, you charge it. When you wake up, what do you do? That early already. So your phone tells a lot about your behavior. And we have a team that is actually looking at that. Well, it turns out, and you will hear it later today as well, that AI is pretty stupid. Supposedly AI is going to be the future, but we'll get there bit by bit. But um, we're not there yet, but we'll get there. So we're looking at design for in 10 years, and there's different ways how you can do it. And this is an example which I love. So this is uh, a future vision of how computers will be. And uh, supposedly we're going to have these screens, and if I would switch on the sound, you will hear that your computer will be And it's really cool. And every surface will turn into a user, like an, an interface. So everything you do will turn into, into, into an interface. But is that really what's going to happen? And uh, I've got in the drawer at my work a thing called Leap Motion. It launched like eight years ago. And it is a thing that with your fingers, you can actually interact with your computer. Okay. Who of you ever did classes in ergonomics? Okay. Where do you normally put your hands? For the best ergonomic position, where do you put your keyboard? Somewhere in here? Good. Why is that? Because it's the most comfortable one. Okay. Have you ever tried doing this for more than 15 minutes? It sucks. So I had to leave motion. I was playing around with Google Earth. You can turn it around and people run. Well, wow, that's so cool. You can turn around 15 minutes. I was dead, man. My arms were like really hurting. So for us, it's like, okay, if I could design for in 10 years, things might change. AI might get better, and you might have a self-driving or a self-flying uh, helicopter, but humans are human. We think like we did. We are like we are. We're not going to replace our feet with, like, bionic feet yet if we don't, really don't need to. We still have relationships. We still might search for love at one moment in time or all the time. And we're still humans, and that's not going to change. So if we design for in 10 years, we have to make it real. We have to make it real because the only way, the only way you can test out if this is a good idea is making the experience. Because I can't test out if I don't experience it. Like a user experience, user experience, test it out. In 10 years, maybe I have to test it out. So um, when you start innovating, we flip around the whole ideation process from how can we which is like solving a problem, to what if. Now I'm going to give you some examples, and uh, 
this is the first one. So this is from a series called Black Mirror, and people might know it. It's this doomsday scenario stuff. Like, if the future, if everything is true, what we're starting now, how could it go as bad as possible? So we, in Alpha, we try to go the middle ground. We look at Black Mirror and say, yeah, that's really, that's true, that it could end up like that. But we look as well as the positive part. So what if you could control the brain from a computer? What if they could put plot, plot ideas or thoughts in your brain? Or what if you could control a computer with your thoughts? Well, this is slightly, I mean, it doesn't look as shiny and beautiful as, as, as the previous one, obviously. But this is reality. And we had a colleague, and he, uh, an ex colleague, and he worked at DARPA, the US uh, uh, the, the innovation unit they had there. And uh, he mentioned, so this is possible, this is a guy that actually has like pins, like you know, which you have in, in, in a motherboard normally, like this kind of pins, stuck in his brain. And he mentioned, well, this is an early prototype of how it could be, but it's not nice because you know, every time you take these pins out, and there were like 12 or 20 pins, and you put them in someone's brain, and every time you take it out, a little piece of brain sticks to it. So that's kind of nasty. So that's where you are now, but this is experience prototype. The future looks beautiful. This is where you are now. So obviously you notice, like, well, let's start it with that the pin is, you know, it doesn't take pieces of brain with you. But this gentleman actually has the box on his head already implanted. And he can actually direct uh, a robot with his brain. So that's good. Or the other one is from a series called Osmosis. Anyone watch that? Good, one person. So it's on Netflix, and the series is that uh, it analyzes your thoughts, it analyzes your personality, and then finds like the perfect person for you. And in the series, they start looking at like, okay, if um, one day to the other, it tells you, well, that's the person that's going to be your soulmate. And you meet the person, and uh, the AI sometimes might get it wrong. And uh, so sometimes it works. I mean, well, you find your soulmate that you never met, and it's, it's beautiful. But there's one guy, and he's in a relationship, and, and, and he's, he breaks up with his boyfriend to go with his ex-boyfriend, which is supposed to be his soulmate, and it turns out it's not really his soulmate. And then actually the guy dies and becomes all really dramatic because it's a TV series. And, but it starts looking at like the downside of how it could be. And that's just by making it real. So uh, on, um, on Black Mirror, the writer there is called Charlie Booker, and what he mentioned that he goes in with his, his team of writers, they lock themselves in a room and they go, what if? So what if um, the algorithm could find your soulmate? Okay, well, we might do this and this. Okay, what if that doesn't work out? Okay, well, this might happen. What if that doesn't work out? And what if then, you know, you got the wrong person? So they go, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if? Until they don't have answers anymore, and then they write the series and then they go, oh, go out of there. Or you might know this one as well. What if an AI turns into a girlfriend? So this is from, this, from the movie Her. Where it's like a, it starts as, a, as an AI assistant that can help you in day to day. But then it turns out that uh, the AI turns kind of in a, in, into, uh, into a girlfriend. And if you ever look at sci fi movies, whatever happens, the AI is Scarlett Johansson. It's always her. Again, here, it's Scarlett Johansson. So, then the question comes out, like, okay, if the AI is actually the girlfriend and she's in your computer, I mean, it's kind of boring. So what you then have, then you have replacement girlfriends that are like the physical version of the AI. It gets really nasty in the movie. You have to give it a try uh, yourself. But it, it raises a lot of questions. It makes it real what something like that could be. But let's go back to, to the work we're doing to hope we can give you some examples of what this could be. So you can be terribly unhappy, and we're talking about mental mental health here, or you can actually be extremely happy. So the little slider there, the little arrow, is what I'll explain you. So now we're going to work on something that's kind of happy, but uh, you know, you might have some some bad days. So we were thinking of what if you could see your partner's mood. So our AI team and research team are looking at. Can we measure ongoingly, just using behavioral data that you have on your phone or wherever you might, might have it, can we, can we measure over time, without you doing anything, what your mood is? Can I have like a score ongoingly, like your location uh, ongoingly, like can I see how your mood is doing? 
And we thought, like, well, imagine that you, that you see that the whole time. Like, where would you see that? And one of the things we thought of, and we were working with, with the guys at MIT Media Lab, on, like, okay, maybe you have something personal just here, you know, like a little thing that shows you how your mood is doing. And then we were what ifing, we turned it into a verb, we were what ifing, and what if you not only can see your own happiness or your mood, but you could see your partner's one. And we said, well, that's interesting, if you really want to do it. So, what we decided to do, and I already, uh, you're not really happy with that one, okay. So we thought, like, well, how do we know if that really is going to work out? So let's first try it out. So uh, this is a, a, a team from um, Portugal, and what they do is they project things onto people's bodies. Uh, they normally use the whole body, but that's not very discreet if you just want to have something discreet. So what we did, we projected it like the state of your partner's happiness as a kind of tattoo on your, on your skin. But how do you prototype something out, like an interactive tattoo, that is not technically possible yet? So we just project it on. And then we asked couples to uh, see what they would do with it. So this is, we asked three couples, asked them, okay, how would you use this? What do you think? So this couple thought it was actually really nice and then, uh, yeah, but then if you go traveling and you're having like a really good time and I'm sitting here at home and I'm having like a sit down, I'm going to get really pissed off with you. Okay. Because normally when you go traveling and do the same, you can never say, wow, the blast, man, it was the best time ever. My wife at home with the kids that are screaming and making a mess out of the house. I have to pretend that, you know, I mean, I'm okay to be with you guys here, but I mean, it's my duty. It's not because of fun or anything like that. And the same with this uh, lady was saying, uh, yeah, but then if I see that you're not doing really good, that's actually nice because then I can help you. Because sometimes, you know, you go on the stage when you don't really talk. Uh, Northern European guys really good at that. You don't really talk. And, like, oh, yeah. and you never know what it is. It's just because, you know, you're watching TV or because you're grumpy or you're really worried about something or whatever reason. So if I can see it, then I can ask you, I'm doing fine. So there were pros and cons. So we just prototyped it out, see how it works, get feedback, and we found out, like, yeah, maybe maybe you have it, but you need to be able to switch it off as well. So if it's a tattoo, then you must be here, and you must be able to stop it. So the next one I'm going to show you is when people are terribly unhappy. And in this case, it's a condition called uh, bipolar disorder. So bipolar disorder is a condition where you can be extremely happy, it's called hypomanic, where you think you rule the world, and, uh, for example, Princess Leia of Star Wars, the actress there, Carrie Fisher, she had it. And she said, it's beautiful, because at one moment, I think I rule the world, I can do everything, I only need four hours of sleep, and, but afterwards, after your hypomanic period, you snap down and you get into really nasty depression. And the more you go up in your hypomanic, and as you call it, walking with angel face, the worse it gets afterwards. So, how you normally treat this is with medication, but as well being self-aware. Because if I'm feeling really good, and I'm like walking with angels, you're not going to convince me I should take my medication. Because what are you going to do? Are you going to make me like flat, like flat, like boring again? I don't want that. So we were looking at what can we do to uh, help people to find out how they're really doing because quite often when you're getting hypomanic, you don't really know what's going on with you, you're just very energetic, well, wow, good day out of today. So what we did is we just prototyped it out. And to, 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 to continue with what Seth has been mentioning, we work with very small teams because just to say that you have a team of 80 people working on innovation, it actually sucks. Trying to innovate with a large team is the worst thing you can ever do. And if you start looking at like small companies that started, it's always this beautiful thing of, you know, we uh, started in a dorm room and there were two guys and it was beautiful. What that started with two guys. And that's how it continues. So we prototype it out and see if it works. And we found that the people really love it. So here you can see like the circle of what stability is. So if you're in the middle of the dog, you're kind of stable. And then it's the out of it. So people see actually how to do it. We test it out with patients, we interview them, and we get feedback from them. Another one we did is Massachusetts General Hospital, and we start looking at people with body image concerns. Again, we looked at how they're doing, we tested it out with them, and then we found out that we need to find out what good looks like. Because without a clear hypothesis, there's no chance I could ever get that. So, what I mentioned before, the clear objective. 
Because you can't manage what you can't measure, but on the other hand, you can't measure what you can't experience. So, how we do that to define it is very simple. We create simple hypothesis cards where we go about, we believe that, our hypothesis, we believe that we can improve someone's health to verify that we will, hmm, we measure that and we write it that. Very simple at the start of a project. In this case, we believe that we can improve people's mental health to verify that we'll launch an application because it's an easy thing. In clinical trial, and we measure a Y-Box score, which is the score for our, how people's mental health is. And we write if we're good as a team in Massachusetts General Hospital, which is the best uh, mental health hospital in the US. And that's how we measure it. So that turned into this product. And it works 55% reduction in people's symptoms, 100% engagement with 10 people, so it's a clinical trial, it's small. Uh, and we do that for 5% of the cost in the normal clinical team. So just to conclude how we get there, if we look at long-term innovation, get out of your best work, just focus on measuring what you really do, and just make it very real. Because although the future is beautiful and bright, we're still humans, and we're going to stay like humans. Thank you. Thank you, Anto. Please come over to the living room. And you can submit your questions there through Slido using the hashtag that we gave you earlier. All right. So, thanks so much. Um, first question up is How do you get managers who are rational, risk averse, or control freaks? To buy into having no roadmap and rowing through ambiguity. Uh, don't work for them. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I've, I've been on both sides. So, I started in the US and I found that, like, sometimes in product management, you're just solving the wrong, uh, the wrong issue. But, yeah, if you have a quite often I find that, like, in large organizations, um, you can innovate as well. There's no excuse, like, they don't let me innovate. Uh, because on the other hand, there's one really good thing in a large organization, it's called the reorg. It's that time of year or every so many years that uh, everyone at the top is like running around and to find out which box goes where and who fits in which box. That's the time that you have time that you can just focus on coming up with ideas. So I would say like just start prototyping something up, go out there first up with users, and after everyone knows more or less, or just before the reorg finishes, you go out well, I created this prototype, I tested that with 10 people, and uh, they love it. And actually, I talked to a possible customer already, and they really would like to work on it. Well, that normally convinces your boss. He might get up, oh, why did you do that? And I didn't give you any approval for that, and, and you know, why did you do it? But on the other hand, it's like, what's stopping you for to go out there? No one tells you to sit in the office from 9 to 5. Uh, you can go out there, do you use it as a prototype? I would just go out there, try out ideas, Never show anything before you have user feedback or some buy-in, and that's how it works. Outstanding. All right. Um, next question. How early can you determine which emerging technologies will be successful? What methods do you use? So how early can you determine which emerging technologies will be successful, and what methods do you use? Um, good question. So, People know the Gartner hype cycle. Okay, so it's kind of cycle where uh, a lot of people use to find out like new technologies, and every year they create one. And uh, it has a very funny thing that it says, okay, the emerging uh, the, the technology starts, and then you have the hype, that's where all the buzzwords come in, and then in one moment it smacks down and it gets to I think called the value of dissolution, uh, where actually it has to become real. Um, so we look at these kind of technologies, but quite often it's like, would you use it? So, all right, our team, for example, is looking like, okay, everyone's messing around with blockchain, so we get it out of the way. Can we use it? We can't use it. So we implemented it, and it turns out it's some stuff that you do under the hood, and in health, no one really cares very much about it. But it's a good and interesting technology that's under the hood, but it's not going to change the user experience. So for us, it's like, well, if you have the technology, just try it out. Try to bring it into your product, your server, and that's it. The technology is not going to change the world. It just enables something that you're already doing anyway. So we just try it out yourself. Like, make it real. If it fits for you or it works for you, then most probably, and it works for 
by the people next to you as well, most probably is going to pick up. If you don't really see how you can use it, most probably it will fade away. All right. Um, how do you ensure privacy within similar services, apps, especially when it comes to mental health? Yeah. So when we design products out with people, um, on the technology part, we're extremely strict on, on, on data privacy. Um, so, for example, uh, in, in mental well-being, we found out in co-designing with, with, with people that there's no chance you want to share any of this with anyone. So it's highly personal. So what we do in our, our, our tech team is work on is that whatever the data you have in your phone, um, nothing leaves that you uh, would not be willing to share. So for example, um, to find out if you're sleeping a lot, uh, I can know, I can start detecting your location from minute to minute. But we as a company, we don't really care about where you are. We just want to know, like, you know, are you sleeping less or more? So what we do is, is well, for the edge computing, that we actually process everything on your phone. And the only thing that leaves uh, is what we really need to know. So if you want to know, are you sleeping less or more? We just need to know, yes, yes or no. That's it. But we don't need anything more. So that's how we take care that you have the privacy. Then on the other hand, it's like how you how you share that. You all know GDPR. You need to show what you use the data for. You can switch it off at any moment, at any time. Obviously, we do that. But on top of it, when you start using the product, we make it extremely clear what you share and what you're not sharing. For a very simple reason. If people are not comfortable with it, they're not going to use it. Therefore, we can't help them to improve their health. Next question is, and we have about two minutes left. Um, with humans still being humans in 10 years, do you believe that products and services will be radically different? Um, the best way to look at it is in the past. I don't know if anyone's seen this 1927 movie called Metropolis, <laughs> where uh, robots will take over the world. Um, look left, right. Did that happen? It's probably not. The Jetsons. When you go business in your car and you drive, and you have like this kind of French made but in a robot version. Anyone have a Roomba? Does it look like a Jetsons uh, French made? Not really. Um, are predictions going to be right? I don't think so. Do people change very fast? Not really. Uh, I would take a little brain of salt. Most probably things will get smarter, but I don't think we'll be running around in flying cars in five years. and have French mates that look like a French mate but in a robot of <laughs> All right. Um, and last question, we have about a minute left. How many people are in your team and what different roles or competencies do they have? Okay. So in total, Alpha Health has 70 people. Uh, so there are 10 people work on AI, 10 in, in research, on, on behavioral analysis. Uh, then we have a team of four, four product managers, and I think like 12 uh, designers from service design, user research, UX, UI. And then we have a development team. Besides that, we have neuroscientists, uh, we have people working with psychiatrists and both psychologists, uh, people on behavioral economics, as well as extremely varied uh, team. All right, please give them to our hands. I would say that was a pretty dense uh, morning. Those guys are also in podcasts. So if you want to check those out, they're on iTunes and on the uxtrack.com website. Um, we are going to have a break now. And three minutes before the break is over, we're going to have a t-shirt giveaway. So please be back on time. Three minutes before. So from 11 to 11.30 is the break. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.